Uh, last week we talked about, uh, we kind of finished up the issue with the Samaritans and uh, it says, um, as it goes on, it says, after the two days, he went forth from there into Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Why do you think that it is that a, a prophet is without honor except in his own country? No. Because familiarity brings contempt. That's, I think that's, I think that's a large part of it. It's too hot out there. Um, I think that's a large part of it is that, is that um, when you, when you grow up in an area and people know you from the time that you're a kid, that there's probably a sense of familiarity there that kind of takes a little bit of the respect away. Uh, but you would think that with, you would think that with Christ, um, having grown up and, and then being able to testify to who he was as a person, that wouldn't be the case. But man is who man is and people are who people are. So um, that is one of the things that Christ said that a prophet is without honor in his own country. And so he's, he spends these two days with the Samaritans. Um, but one thing, one thing that to keep in mind as we go through the rest of this chapter is that there really is a, a theme between the physical and the spiritual that's going on here, which is interesting because one of the reasons why this gospel is written has a lot to do with the Gnostics and their, um, their idea of the physical and the spiritual. And so I, I find that that's kind of interesting. And the way that thing plays out here is that we are fascinated and um, what's the word I want to look for uh oh i hate when i lose a word fixated on the physical around us and we don't give a lot of thought to the spiritual realm and to the spiritual reality around us and that's one of the things that you see in john 3 with the conversation of nicodemus and also with the conversation of the samaritan woman and the other thing that is um, something that we see here too, that's an interesting thing, is the difference between miracles and signs, uh, believing because of what you see and believing because of what you hear. Um, that's another one of the themes that you see playing out here. Keep that in mind as we go through. There's two layers to this story that I want to talk about. And for those of you who are interested in an outline, um, I have an outline for this particular uh, part of, of John 4. The first main point is, um, I'm calling it the second sign in Galilee. And then, the second main point is um, the sick son and the seeking father. And then the third main point is the son's word. And then the fourth main point is the slave's confirmation. I 
I'm back. Had to get my wife's phone for. Her. So those are four main points in this, these particular verses, 46 through 54. Um, and so let me read the this section and then we'll just go verse by verse. It says, therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official, this probably means this guy was part of Herod's court. There was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Capernaum's a little bit of a distance away. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the, at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the hour that Jesus had said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So there's a lot we can glean. Now, the first layer of this, I gave you those four main outlines for that. But then I also want to add to that, that also what can be found in this story is what I call the steps to faith. The steps to faith. The first step is desperation. The second step is persistence. The third step is acceptance. The fourth step is confirmation. And the fifth step is conversion. So you see this play out in this story and we'll we'll kind of uh, we'll we'll talk about that too. So we see Christ coming out of now also there's there's a real contrast here and you notice Jesus is coming out of the Samaritans. Now according to what John wrote Jesus stayed with the Samaritans for 2 days. But there's nothing said about him doing any miracles. And remember, what's interesting is that the Samaritans said, they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. I think it's really, it's, it's very interesting and also an indictment on the Jews at this point that the Samaritans were willing to accept and believe simply by God's word, where the Jews always needed to see a miracle. And it says that, it says 
the Galileans received him. Why? Having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem. Because they were at the feast. So they're excited about him because of the miracles that he did. The Samaritans were excited about him because of the word that he spoke, the word of life. And I think, let me just say that I think that this is an interesting contrast today, if I may draw it, and I will, between what we see as a church in America that lives by having to see miracles and prosperity doctrine in order for them to believe and another type of church in America that simply believes because their faith is in the word of God and there's no necessity for miracles or prosperity or any of that for them to believe what God says so Ultimately, what we see here is that the, uh, the importance that our faith be established in God's word. If your faith is established in the word of God, it's an immovable faith. But if your faith has to be supported by your emotions or what you see or miracles or blessings, then your faith will always be at, at risk. I think this is really, to be honest with you, I think this is the difference between a true and false gospel. And I think that we need to understand that because that listen there are a lot of i was watching this documentary today about this uh, faith healer in brazil and all these people are flocking to him and of course it turns out he's a big fake but um the thing is is that all none of these people they said they were christians but none of them knew god's word Otherwise, when this guy says he's channeling entities, you know, that, that should have been a red flag. He never spoke the gospel. He was, it was always about him. And it was always about Saint this or Saint that is speaking through me. You know, and this is part of the problem, I think, is that people who claim to be Christians really do not know. God's word. And, and I would say, you know, why is that? Well, I think a big reason is, is because their faith is not built on the word of God. Their faith is built on their own construct of what they think faith or religiosity or spirituality should look like. And so you have people flirting with new age type of ideas and embracing oh we i embrace all religions and you know this is the kind of thing that comes out of someone who is not their faith is not a faith born out of the word of god but their faith is born out of their own construct and we have to be very careful that we do not try to create our own gospel that appeals to our flesh and appeals to us, but that we embrace the gospel that is spoken out of the Bible. And what the reality of true doctrine is as the Bible communicates it. But in order for us to understand that, that means we have to read it. And so um, that is, I think, a challenge in the church today is that not many Christians really study their Bible, nor is it really being uh, taught accurately in the churches as well. So 
this is a theme that we see running through John, and that is this theme of believing in the word of God and that your faith is in the son of God and the word of God. And so Christ returns and the Jews there in Galilee, now he, I mean, how refreshing it must have been for Christ to be among these Samaritans who were simply believing because of what he said. And now he comes into Galilee and they're excited to see him. Now, get this. They received him having seen all the things that he did. Notice it doesn't say they received him having heard all the things that he said. So their focus is on the outward and on the miraculous. So it says, therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So here you have a man who is in desperation for the life of his son. And I'm going to tell you that faith always begins at a place of desperation. And the reason for that is, is that as, as a person who is receiving the gospel, one of the first things that you realize is your state of sinfulness. And not only the state of your sinfulness, but your desperate helplessness to retrieve yourself out of it. And that is one of the first things that somebody realizes in there. Hey, Amy, you had a question? Someone's raising a hand. You, you got to unmute yourself, though. Um. Well, I was thinking about that. If I don't, does faith always begin in desperation? Because, like, when I, um, you know, first came to Jesus, I was a pretty little girl and, uh, for, you know, fairly young, and I don't think I was desperate. I just thought I believed in Jesus. Well, at some point in your life in conversion, there is the repentance of sins. Nowhere in the Bible do you see salvation without the repentance of sin. Repentance means a change of mind, which means that your thinking about sin has to change. And it's not only that sin is wrong, because everyone knows sin is wrong. So that's, that's just a small part of the repentance. The real issue here is the realization of your helplessness to save yourself out of your own sin. And okay. I think anyone, anyone that is, is converted at some point has to come to that realization. But maybe not right away. I mean, like when I'm well, like- I think, I, I think that, I think a lot of times what happens, Amy, is that children who grow up in a Christian environment, they believe mentally in Jesus. Right. But, but they're, they don't have the maturity intellectually or emotionally to understand the uh the the um the word i'm looking for <laughs> abstract part of this and that is um the issue of sin and death and our helplessness in sin that is a part of the gospel 
and and that and that that's what Christ communicated to the woman at the well, and that's what he communicated to Nicodemus. You must be born again. And so I think a lot of people uh, they say, well, I just I was born a Christian, you know, kind of thing, and I just always believed it. Well, at some point, there has to be. Uh, you can't just inherit your Christianity. At some point, there has to be a working of the Holy Spirit, and there has to be a new birth. Now, I will, let me go back to um, the Psalms. No, I'm sorry, not the Psalms. What am I thinking? <laughs> um, back, back to uh, uh, Matthew in this, on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, listen to what Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount. Because what is he talking about? Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount is talking about what it means to come into relationship with God and what is the effect that it has on, on, on your life. Um, he says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, this is the first step of salvation. Blessed are the poor. And the word there that Jesus uses for poor means abject poverty. It's the type of, of poverty that you don't know where you're getting your next meal and you may not survive to see tomorrow because of your poverty. And he says, blessed are the poor, the desperate, the desperately poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. So what is he saying here? He's saying the first part of conversion is when you realize your desperate poverty spiritually that you are bankrupt, that you are helpless, that you are hopeless. And, and if you read the sermon, this is step-by-step -step conversion because the first part of conversion is the desperation of your own spiritual poverty. Then it says, blessed are those who mourn. That's repentance. Blessed are those who mourn. Once you realize how spiritually impoverished you are, you respond by mourning. That is, uh, re that is repentance, that is contrition. And then he says, then he's, but, but those who mourn, those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, those are the people that go to heaven, the ones who believe and understand they're, they're desperate, spiritually desperate. So that, that's why I say this. And well, then... Okay. I guess what I'm saying is that, okay, I, I knew I, I like very strongly that I believed in Jesus as a child, but I, you know, as I went to Christian school and went to Sunday school, you know, all these different things, events that happen in your life, then those, you know, need that even more repentance and desperate, you because know, you understand it more, you understand what's going on more, but to say that, I didn't have faith, you know, before I even got it even better. I don't know if that's true. Well, well yeah, I, I think it is true. And I'll tell you why. Because yeah. the Bible's clear about what salvation is. It's repentance. It's confession. You know, as you grew and heard the gospel, you came to a point in your life where you realized that you were desperately a sinner and you called out for salvation. Okay. You're not going to call out for salvation until you reach that point. That's all over the Bible. That's not even to be contested. There, salvation and the gospel work in a specific way. And again, I point, I'm not, this is in my opinion, I'm pointing right to the, right to the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus okay. lays this out. If okay, if you're the you're the elect thing, right? Okay, so eventually you're you know God knew Amy was going to come to that, right? But then no, he didn't know he didn't know you were going to come to that. 
he brought you to that. Oh, that's right. He brought he brought me to that. But in in a certain uh, step by step fashion, I'm just I'm just trying to get the thing like with little kids who you know you know I believe in Jesus. You know they're six or seven and the, and they they seem to. I mean I taught at a Christian school, and but are they are they real Christians then yet? Well, or, I think it. Well, I think it's six or seven you're kind of at the age, you're not at the age of accountability at that point. Okay. So, you know, again, like what I'm saying is you had to come to a specific moment in your life where you recognized your desperation and called out to Christ. That's when you were saved. Now, okay. we, now were, were you as good as saved when you were little because of God's elective process? Yes. Okay. But it's a very important, yeah, it's very important for us to, to nail this stuff down because um, people need to know that in salvation, there needs to be this, this realization of one's own sin and desperate need for salvation. And that I think is an irrefutable part of I agree with that of, of, of salvation because it's a work of God on the heart. So that that's why I say that. And if if you guys have some time, look at the Sermon on the Mount because what you see is the salvation of a person all all through. It says, and then you know the mourning part is the is the 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 repentance over sin. Then blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. That is, you begin to respond uh, out of humility towards your salvation and towards others. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. As you grow in your salvation, you hunger and thirst for uh, the righteousness of Christ in your life. And it says you'll be satisfied. Then it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. You begin to, uh, because you understand the mercy that God has given you, you begin to become a person of mercy. You should. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You begin to pursue purity in your life. This is sanctification is what he's explaining here. Salvation and sanctification. And guess what? What's at the very end of the road? Blessed are you when people insult and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. That is the point of, of the, you know, that believers in their sanctification um, that's that's a blessing. It's a blessing to be insulted because of who you are in Christ. And it and and in the Beatitudes, if I'm correct, as you said, that all goes in order, right? It, as it said in the in the yeah, I, it, it, yeah. If you look at that, yeah. it goes in the order, and it starts. But where does it start? From desperation. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, that's really good explanation. I like that. Okay, so. Um, we see the same kind of desperation in the father as he is pursuing Christ. Now, he is desperate for a different reason, but I think that we see that like with the woman at the well, she started off wanting some water that was so she'd never have to come back to the well and then began to realize the issue was not her physical need, the issue was her spiritual need. Here, in the same way, the father is coming to Christ because he's desperate for the life of his son. He believes that Christ can heal him. And he travels. He's not just a, he, now, he's not just a couple of miles away. And I'll tell you why. Because it says, um, it says that Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. And then, it, and then it says, and as he was going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. He inquired at what hour when, they began, when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday. So he spent a whole day traveling. So that, that tells you that there's a real desperation there, and, and not only a desperation, but a persistence. 
that this father would travel a long way because he really did believe that Jesus would be able to, to heal him. And it's interesting because it, it says, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So he was trying to get Jesus, you know, to take this whole day's journey with him to see his son. That, that's pretty persistent. And it said, the royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Now, look what, look what, look what Jesus says to him, because I think it is, it is interesting. He says, uh, before he says that, so, so Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now, this is really interesting, how Jesus handles this situation. Because he confronts the man and he says, you know, um, why is it that you guys have to see miracles in order to believe? Why is it that you can't just take my word for it? So what does he do? This is interesting because it shows the compassion of Christ, but it also shows um, Christ bringing this man to a, a faith that is not a faith that is not established on works, but on his word. So the, the royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go. Your son lives. Now look at what it says. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke. Now, do you think John wrote that on accident or do you think he's trying to make a point? This man wanted his son healed. He believed that Jesus could do it. Jesus did heal his son. But he made the man take him at his word. He, he, did, he didn't go down with him to the man's house. He simply said, go, your son lives. And how did the man respond? Did he say, no, 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 you got to come down. He believed Jesus. He took Jesus at his word and he left. Now, what does that say about what the man believed, the power that and authority that resided in Christ? That Christ would be able to heal simply by a word spoken, you know, 50 miles away. That's a, that's a pretty amazing thing on its own. But it's also put this man at a crossroads to either continue to beseech Christ to come down and heal his son or to take Christ at his word. So you see the man's desperation and you see his persistence, but then you see his acceptance. He believed. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. Now, he didn't hang around. He left. Hey, Tony, he, quick he question went. for you. Sure. Sorry. So, I mean, he believed, but he didn't know who Christ was just yet. Is that right? Um, you know what? I'm not sure who he thought Christ was, a great prophet or whatever, but he believed he had the ability to heal his son. And, he, and what's interesting is that Jesus said to him, you won't believe unless you see signs. 
So what's the implication there? What is he, what is he saying? What does he want him to believe? He wants him to believe his words and not just. And what was his words? That he sees. And what was his words? His words were the gospel. They were the gospel, yeah. So that would have been. And I, know, think the, it, the, I think it, I think it shows later on. We we it answers this question that whether he understood Jesus to be the Son of God, the Messiah, at that point or not, by the time he gets home, he he knows. Is it a passage he wants him to believe that he has healed that that son? At that point in the you know what I mean? No, no. That's Who was that? I didn't hear. Uh, and that's you're, the, um, it's a little hard to hear you. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Um, I was saying that I think he wants him to believe that he has healed his son. He wants him to believe that he can heal his son. That he is that he has done it. I mean, I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out what point you guys are are talking about, but it seems like that is right after he says, "Believe that it is already done." You know. Well, he says. Why is it that you won't people you people won't believe unless you see signs and miracles? So the belief here is not in the sign or the miracle. The belief has to do with something else. And and what that and we gotta we gotta realize that by this time Jesus had been in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea, and he had been preaching the gospel. Now that's kind of assumed here by John. I mean, what it what look, Jesus spent two days with these Samaritans. What do you think he was telling them? For two days. Jesus spent two days with these Samaritans talking to them. What was he telling them? He was telling them that he was the savior of the world. Because what did the Samar what did the Samaritans say? They said after it said here, and, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. So obviously Jesus was being very candid that he was the son of God and the savior of the world that he was there to bring salvation to those who would put their faith in him. And that's why he says, you will not believe without miracles. Well, but, you have to se separate the miracles from what the actual, uh, when he says you will not believe, what is he talking about? Believe what? Not believe in the miracles, obviously he's doing them, but believe what he says about who he is. That he is the savior of the world. That he is the Messiah. They, they're not believing it. They're not listening to him. They just want to see miracles. So this man comes in desperation. And Jesus is looking at him. He's like, save my son. He's dying. And Jesus is like, you know, what is it with you people? You always want to see miracles. How come you're not asking me about your eternal salvation? And you're worried about your son's life when your son's spiritual life hangs in the balance. Your soul and your son's soul and your family's soul hangs in the balance by what I am saying, but all you can think about is the physical. You want me to do this miracle for you, but do you want me to save you? You know, lots of Christians or people who say they're Christians, they want Jesus to do things for them, but they don't want Jesus. And there's a difference there. And what's really interesting is what Jesus does here is he, he gives this man his request, but he also gives him faith. Because what ends up happening, it says, Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. And what, how does the man respond? Did the man believed the word 
that Jesus spoke. And as he was going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them, and here's where you have affirmation or confirmation. When did he begin to get better? And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And now listen to what it says. And he himself believed and his whole household. Believed what? They believed he was see, the this, at this, point. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Because this is what Jesus was preaching. He wasn't trying to wrap it up in a mystery. He was preaching the gospel. And they, but they were so, now the Samaritans, listen, he didn't do any miracles in Samaria, but they believed on him, that he was the savior of the world, just by his words. And the Jews had to see miracles. And even when they saw miracles, here's the irony. Even when they saw miracles that the Samaritans didn't get to see, they still wouldn't believe his words. And see, the, today, I would suggest that this dichotomy still exists today. That, that you see this issue of Christians who have to live their, their faith always has to be an emotional, experiential type of thing. Jesus has to be doing something to prove their faith rather than reading what God's word says, accepting it. And I don't care how I feel. I believe it. I don't care if I, I don't, I don't care if I'm going through a trial. If I'm, if I don't care if I, I'm dealing with pain or I'm dealing with suffering, I know what God's word says is true. That's faith. And the problem is, is that so many of the churches today are preaching a gospel that is antithetical to this. It's a gospel of prosperity and a gospel of, you know, and then on the other hand, you don't have that. You have these, these liberal theologians who are, who are preaching uh, gospels of embracing everything that Jesus isn't the only special one J just be a good person and do good things that's not the gospel either these people are just as lost as as people who think they have to have a miracle to believe in Jesus you either believe the word of God and abide by it or you don't and and that kind of faith is the faith given by God. That is saving faith. And so John is using this miracle to, again, accentuate this point of what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to believe? What does that really look like? He shows it in the conversation with Nicodemus. Then he shows it in the conversation with the woman at the well. Then he shows it at the conversation with the Samaritans. And now he shows it again in this conversation in reaction with the, 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 the father in regards to his son. And so it's... It, it's really interesting. We have to, it's really important that we understand that. And I think be, because we, you know, obviously we, we don't have all of, you know, the sermons that Christ spoke and what he did. Like John says, it would fill all the books in all the world. Um, but we have to understand that Jesus wasn't walking around being mysterious. Jesus was very, I mean, come on, we're going to see later on. In fact, John, John really makes it clear that Jesus made it clear to everyone that he was God. 
And so there was no, you know, there wasn't any ambiguity about what Jesus was claiming because that's why they crucified him. So I think, you know, that's, that's important for, that's important for us to, to, to understand that. Hey, Tony, can I ask you one more so, question? I'm trying to keep it pithy. Sure. I really am. Um, no, no, that's fine. We're, we're fine because I'm at the end yeah. of this here. So we're getting ready <laughs> for the Q and A at this point. Okay, great. Um, so, I mean, these people, you know, like the woman, the Samaritan woman, they're all figuring out who Christ is even before the disciples are. I mean, wasn't Peter the first one to figure it out? Or, I mean, I remember when- Well, we see, okay. we see Peter say, you know, well, I, no, I, I, the disciples believed that he was the Christ. That here's the problem. No one really understood what that they, meant. Yeah, they didn't know what it meant. That makes sense. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so, and, 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 and here's the thing. Can you come to a saving knowledge of Christ without the knowledge of all that, that, you know, who Jesus is in a sense? Yes. Because the issue is you are responding. You know, he can save you. You know, his death has saved you and that he's the son of God. But that's very little knowledge as you begin to get into the word and you grow as a Christian, you learn so much more about who Christ is, right? So um, in the same way, the disciples are, this is developing uh, revelation for them. You know, they believe that he's the Messiah, but they don't know what that means. They don't know he has to die, that he's going to raise again, uh, that they're going to have to go in, you know, they're... At this point, the disciples are probably thinking, well, you know what? We're going to go into Jerusalem. We're going to overthrow the Romans. Yeah. We're all going to sit on thrones. I mean, that's what they're thinking. That Jesus is like, boy, I got a surprise for you. But that's that's okay. That's where they're at at this point. The, it, so that, here's the issue. Is that a saving the knowledge, though, at that is, point? Um. It's, it's, well, what did Jesus say to them when he washed their feet? He said, my word has made you clean. Right. Okay. So here's what, what's the difference between someone who is a, a believer in the old Testament, as opposed to a believer in the new Testament, the believer in the old Testament believed that God by his mercy would cleanse them from their sin. So their faith was in God for their salvation, that they were saved by faith. Now here, as, as things are being revealed, and a true, a true Old Testament believer, and this is what you see happen, by the way. It, what happens in the book of Acts when Peter preaches this sermon and 5,000 people are saved at the drop of a hat? Boom, boom, they're saved. Those people were Old Testament believers who were now becoming New Testament believers. They were already living by faith. And that's the thing. A real believer will always accept what God's word says about Christ. The Old Testament believers, they believed that their, their salvation was by God's mercy to cleanse them of their sin, not by any works that they did. They just didn't know how he was going to do it. When Jesus was presented to them as God's means, because they were truly saved, they embraced it and received the Holy Spirit. Okay, and those who were about. not it, well, it is because yeah. you have to say, well, how did people in the Old Testament get saved? Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 it's very simple. You go over to, um, you go over to, to, to Galatians. And um, what, does Paul, what does Paul say? Uh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And then he goes into um, talking about, um, let's see, where he talks about, 
uh, the, the scripture, okay, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying all the nations of the earth will be blessed in you. And then, and then he goes on, and he, he, he says that those of you who say that um, the law of Moses, uh, he says here, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners among the Gentiles, nevertheless, knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we have been justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, since by works of the law, no flesh will be justified, and that is a quote out of the Old Testament, and it's, uh, I won't want, it's not the one I want to find, um, hold on, let me get to this, because this is, when he, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it, and I hate when I do that, I very rarely can't find something, but for some reason, I'm not seeing it. It's in Galatians, and he talks about it's always been by faith that salvation has occurred because Abraham accepted God's word by faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And for some reason, I, uh, I really need my glasses. Well, that's really frustrating. Where's Robert Lou when you need him? Yeah, where Romans is Robert? Four, three. Hey, Robert. Ah. What? Well Romans four three, right on, Robert. I knew you'd come through. Well, for the, go ahead and read. For what does it. the go scripture ahead and read it say? It. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Romans four three. I was thinking Galatians four. Right? No wonder that I one. Find the book. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. It was credit. It, it was credited to him, and in Galatians, Paul makes the argument. Because the Judaizers were saying that the Mosaic law came before Christ. Therefore, the Mosaic law takes precedence over the gospel. But then Paul comes back and says, yeah, but Abraham came before Moses. And Abraham's faith, uh, Abraham's righteousness was through faith. So it's always been by faith. So those who were saved in the Old Testament... We're not saved by doing the works of the law. They were saved by faith. And that faith was that God would cover their sins by his mercy. That if they were to confess and repent, he would wash their sins away. And so they, those who believe that, like David, right? Those who believe that were saved, obviously, or, or that means no one was saved until the first Christian. So those, those who were saved were always saved by faith in, in, in God. And add, but, but those Old Testament Christians that were alive during the time of Christ, when they heard the gospel, they readily embraced it. Are you, because to them, it was just the completion of their Judaism. Are you talking about the, Galatians 3, 6? Go ahead and read that one. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm not supposed to talk. Oh, oh okay, I'll do it. That's Cindy. I didn't know that was you, Cindy. Cindy, don't talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hard to do. I know it's hard for you because you, you like to share in the conversation I'd be in trouble if I couldn't talk 3-6 uh, even, even so oh here it was right in front of me I kept skipping right over it even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons See. of Abraham that's what I was trying to say. So thank you, Cindy. You always come through for me. Um, so uh, that, that's exactly what I was trying to say. So those people 
who had a true faith in God, when they heard the gospel to them, it made all the sense in the world. And so that's why you see so many Jews getting saved hmm. in, in the book of Acts, because there was, they were true believers. And so they were hearing the completion, you know, of their faith. And of course, they embraced it. Tony, this was very thorough. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you, Robert, for your input on that, because that just uh, fortifies what Galatians uh, 3 6 says as well. That's important for us to understand that um, salvation has always been by faith and by God's grace. Are we in question and answer time now? Yes, we are. Okay. The floor is open. Just jump in there, Nicole. You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, because I can't God. see. I Thanks can't God. see I have everybody. A question for you, Tony. Um, sure. What do you what do you mean by saved in the Old Testament? It's my I'm I'm confused by that word. Um because it's my understanding that. Christ, when he res when he when he when he was crucified, broke the the gates of Hades. So when you say saved and you talk about that in the New Testament, what do you what does that mean? Well, because like, they didn't well, go to heaven then, right? Because because the thief was the first to enter paradise, right? Right. They they were in they were in those who died in the Old Testament that lived by faith. That's what I mean by those who are saved, because they live by faith. In other words, they believed God's word. They believed that God was who he said he was. They believed that if they sinned, they could come to him and he would wash their sins away. That their salvation was always based on the merciful act of God to wash their sins away. Okay, I hear you. Thank you for clarifying. I wasn't sure if that meant that you were saying that they went to heaven before Christ was crucified. Well, no, nobody went to heaven until until Christ was crucified, and then he led everyone into heaven from Hades. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that correctly. Thanks, Tony. No problem. Tony, would it be correct to say that because Christ uh, has always existed, he was probably, uh, you know, in the Garden of Eden, he walked with Adam and Eve, you know, in the physical form. And yeah, I believe also, that when they walked with God in the Garden of Eden, they were walking mm -hmm. with Christ. Yeah, same thing with Abraham, same, you know, Moses. Mm -hmm. So if they believed then, um, it was credited to them to, yeah, for their righteousness. Mm -hmm. They knew that God, it was God that was going to, to cleanse their, their sin. And it's even funny because, you know, even Job, which is the, the first book written in the Bible, um, even Job testifies to the resurrection, uh, the first resurrection of the saints. He says, I know my Redeemer in my flesh. Mm. Though I die in my flesh, I will see my Redeemer. I don't know if I can find that. But no, I'll have Robert do it. Robert will look it up. <laughs> He's got the computer. I don't have. The what's the what's the quote? That's in Job. Uh, Job says, um, "Though I die, in my flesh mm. I will see my redeemer." Something like that. Job nineteen twenty five through twenty seven. What is it? I, uh, Job nineteen twenty five through twenty seven. What? Go ahead and read it. Uh, let me pull it up. Hold on. 
Sorry, Robert, I didn't mean to grandstand on you. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It, it just, uh, when you do a search, if it is not exactly, I'm not going to uh, yeah. get the right. Yeah. Job 19, what? 25 to 27, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, King James here, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, that's kind of gross, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, Though my reins be consumed within me. That's all I got. That's a pretty, that's a, and that's the first book of the Bible written. And he's yeah. testifying to the resurrection and seeing mm. his redeemer face to face in his flesh. Though the worms destroy my flesh, yet in my flesh I will see my redeemer. So that, that's uh, the first record of the resurrection, the first resurrection that we find in Revelation 19. Wow. Wild. Wild stuff, man, wild. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in, in Job. Uh, Job uh, talks about the earth being round. Yep. Job talks about the hydrological, uh, the hydrological system. Mm-hmm. He lays it all out, evaporation, condensation, and uh, I was going to say perspiration, but <laughs> it's, uh, what do you call it when it rains? <laughs> um, precipitation. 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 Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> evaporation, condensation, precipitation. Yeah, the hydrological cycle. He talks about that. So, I mean, just the first book of the Bible written, and you see all this you know, stuff in there, the first resurrection, the fact that the earth is round, the hydrological system. I mean, it's just really interesting. He kind of mentions dinosaurs yeah. too, doesn't he? Dinosaur in Job 40. Yeah, really? he does. The behemoth. The great behemoth. It sounds like a brontosaurus. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, that kind of puts Job in the same time as the dinosaurs. So or at least knowing human. about them. Yeah. You know. Well, that's wild stuff. Yeah, I do have another, a question. I'm I can't talk that much, but um, Cindy, what you what you should do, Cindy, is you should type them over to Pat so he can ask. I was just going to say that. Then I you're know, not I'm hurting, not I will be your that, voice. But this is yeah. quick. This is quick. Okay. I okay. keep looking for it because I keep reading uh, John all the way through and I can't find it. But um, it's where Jesus talks about eating his, people have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And then it says, even the disciples said, this is hard. Yeah. Uh, this is hard to hear. And then a lot of people left Jesus. And I can see why people would leave Jesus because that is a little bit crazy. And I know that Catholics get their the way they yeah. believe from that. Transubstantiation to get out of there. Yes, but um, anyway, could you could you um, make some sense out of that? I've never been able to. Well, okay. So what? What Jesus is, what Jesus is saying there, um, when he says, I'm, gonna, "I'm trying to find it here," so therefore we're saying, um, it's the, it's around the feeding of the five thousand. It's after he walks on water. Okay. People, yeah, I think I found it. Um, Possibly, oh yeah, uh, Jesus answered them and said, truly I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. In other words, uh, and the word sign there means you saw proof that I am God. You're not following me because you saw proof that I am the son of God. You're following me because you filled your stomachs. Mm -hmm. And uh, do not work for the food which perishes, 
but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, which is a messianic term, they all knew, will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. You can't get much more gospel than this. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in whom he has sent. Mm -hmm. Just believe me. Listen to me and believe me. That's the work. Faith. Faith. And uh, so they said to him, what then? Do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven. See, they're still after filling their stomachs. They're still after the physical. That Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who, who has given you bread out of heaven, but it is, it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down to the world. Then he said to them, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you do not, you have not seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me will come to me. How's that for an elective verse? And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. Um, oh, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, okay. Believes in me will have eternal life. Where is he at? Come down, grumble, grumble. Oh, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven. I am the living bread. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I also give to the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue. And Jesus said to them, unless you eat of my flesh, of the, the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you will have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food and my blood is drink. He who eats my, my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And this is where they go, okay, that's too weird for us. But here's the interesting thing, Cindy. The whole time, he kept telling them what he, what he was meaning by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's, he, he kept saying that, that, you know, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. So... All along, he's comparing himself because they want to eat bread for their stomachs. Oh, Moses gave us manna. He goes, well, number one, Moses didn't give you manna. I gave you manna. And he says that. He says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. Moses didn't create the manna. God created the manna. And now God has given you a better bread for you to eat of. What he's talking about, uh, Cindy, is he's talking about the gospel. Christ's body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. And when he says you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, what he's saying is you need to have faith in my death and my resurrection. You need to understand that my body being broken for you and my blood being spilled for you is what is going to bring you eternal salvation because that's what he keeps talking about here is eternal life. So they, because again, um, they're spiritually blind at this point and the the crucifixion hasn't happened, even the disciples, right? But what's, what, is the, what is the divider here? This is what's interesting. Um, G, uh, it says, uh, therefore, many of disciples who heard this said, this is a difficult statement who can listen to it. But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? 
what then if you see the son of man ascending to where he was before it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing the words that i have spoken to you are spirit and are life see he's making the connection for them the blood the the flesh this is his crucifixion i'll be ascending my my words are life the spirit are is in my words but there are some of you who do not believe for jesus knew from the beginning who was it that did not believe and who would betray him as he was saying that uh, and he was saying this for the reason i've said to you the, no one can come to me unless no one can come to me unless it has been granted to them by the father can't make it much clearer than that as a result of this many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. Why? This is an issue of faith. Are they going to believe his words? And not only that, when you can't fully understand the words of Christ, will you believe in him anyway? Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways. So uh, Jesus said to the 12, now listen, because this, this is, this is the, the point. Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So Peter said, look, I don't understand a word you just said, and it is. It's hard to, to, to accept what you just said, but this I do know. You are the only one who can save me. My faith is in you. And even when I don't understand your words, I'm going to place my faith in you because I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. And so at this time, they didn't understand what he was talking about was his crucifixion eating of his flesh and drinking of his, and remember when they had communion, he said, you know, you are eating of my flesh, you're drinking of my blood, because what he was passing to them on the communion table had traditional significance regarding the salvation of the Jews. So he was saying, I'm the fulfillment of the Passover. It will be my flesh that is broken and my blood that is spilled for your salvation. Now they understood this afterwards, right? But as he said, but even though they didn't understand it, they trusted him. Him. And that's the point. Because there are going to be times when you know you're going to go through trials in your life and you're not going to understand why God is actually doing it, but you're going to trust in the person of Christ even though you don't understand the circumstances. And there's a lot of things we read in the Bible that we may not understand, but we still what? We trust in the word of God. We trust in the person of Christ. And we realize I'm not going to understand everything, and, and, but sooner or later, I'll find out what it means. God will open it up to me, and then I'll understand it. So this here is a preaching of his death, and the need that the Jews need him to die and, and to, to have his flesh broken and to have his blood spilled, he needs to do this to bring them to salvation. And they, uh, they just, they're not understanding that. And eating his flesh and drinking his blood is accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, does, that make, so does that make sense? It makes total sense. So I think what you're saying is that the, even the disciples had really not, they really didn't understand. But like Simon Peter said, where would we go? Who, who, know, who has the words of life, eternal life? Basically what he's saying is, I don't understand the words you just said, but because they're coming out of your mouth, 
I know that I need them. And so Jesus knew they, they had no way of understanding what was going to happen in the future based on that, but yeah. that they were going to stay with him. And so the disciples who left, you know, it says these words are too hard for us. They left because it wasn't worth it for them to stay. It was too, too confusing. And also it sounded pretty, you know, it, it sounded pretty awful. What are you talking about eating your body and yeah, your I, blood? I, yeah, I think that, that um, again, what, but what's really interesting about this, Cindy, is that Jesus sandwiches this discussion um, between two verses where he says, one, no man can come to the son unless the father uh, him. brings him. And then after he says what he says, he says, no man comes to the son unless the father is granted, you know, or I will not lose any the father has given me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he sandwiches those. In other words, no matter how hard my words will be, those who are the elect will continue on. Yeah. Okay. That makes total because sense. It, it's God. It's God's spirit that is bringing them along. Mm -hmm. overcoming their doubts and fears and mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. and we by the way we also don't know that that later on after the crucifixion we don't know that that these other disciples may have have come back and realized we don't know we can't assume that you know uh they never got saved you're right because now it makes sense now it makes sense right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, Tony. So it, it, yeah. Uh, would you mind talking about the uh, transubstantiation, knowing that among us there might be some brother, brothers and sister might be coming from that faith? Yeah, that that the transubstantiation is a uh, it's a misunderstanding of of. Um, what communion is. Um, I still, I mean, I, I, I get it. <laughs> you read this passage, but you have to read this passage in the context of what Jesus is saying regarding the manna in the wilderness um, and what that means. Uh, and, and and then, you know, obviously, when he's giving the communion in, uh, in the, uh, the Last Supper, you know, he says, this is my body, which is, this is my blood. Um, this is figurative language. But for whatever reason, and, and I think, to be honest with you, I think the Catholic Church uses it as a way to consolidate power over an influence over their people, because if you want to participate um, in the blood and body of Christ in order to go to heaven, you've got to come to the Catholic church to do it, where the priest can magically transform the bread into the actual flesh of Christ and the wine into the actual blood of Christ. So a lot of Catholic theology was designed to keep people imprisoned within the catholic church so how did they do that during the pandemic i have something to share about this may i Who, who's that oh it's nicole sure go ahead yeah thanks tony so um so it's not so i'm an orthodox christian and um i believe as an orthodox christian that Holy Communion is partaking of the body and blood of Christ. Um, I guess that's, is that what you're referring to as trans, trans what, I'm sorry? Transubstantiation, yeah. Okay, transubstantiation. So, so that goes back to before the Catholic Church started. The Catholic Church started in 1054 with the Great Schism. So before that, there was one church. So the belief that Holy Communion is the body and blood of Christ goes back to, to that last supper. 
so I just wanted to say it's not just the Catholic Church. Um, yeah, yes, it is. It is actually because the writings of Polycarp, uh, Polycarp was actually discipled by John, uh, who wrote this gospel. The, the writings of, of, of the forefathers um, and the early church fathers, uh, none of them said that they believed in. Uh, in fact, by the way, one of the reasons why the Roman Catholic Church persecuted, or, or not sorry, uh, the, the Roman emperors uh, persecuted the Christians, uh, one of the reasons that they gave is that they were cannibals because they were told that they drank blood and ate flesh. And in one of the defenses to the emperor by one of the first or second, the second century church fathers who said, um, you've been misinformed. We celebrate communion. It is not actual blood. It is not the actual body. It's the representation of what Christ has done. So he makes an apologetic for the communion. So actually, Nicole, that doesn't track. Okay, we just have to agree to disagree with that one, okay. Tony. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it's Tony, as I understand it, because um, I, I remember this when I went to Lutheran school, uh, they used to say, the pastor would say, Lutherans believe that we are are um, you know partaking of the actual body and blood of Christ during the communion, and Catholics, um, it's like they they transubstantiation is actually that the priest, um, you know, by his um, by a certain word, changes the Eucharist into the body and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. So. So in other words, I was taught that Catholics believe that the priest does something before the ceremony to change the body, the blood and the, the sorry, the wine and the Eucharist into the body and blood of Christ. And then my, what I was taught by the Lutheran church is, and they would tell, me, tell us the difference. They would say, no, 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 that's wrong. The priest has no power to change it, that just by partaking of communion, you are partaking in um, uh, in in eating the body and blood of Christ. That's what Lutherans used to say. Yeah, that's that's uh, the Catholic is transubstantiation, right. and that that is the belief that the Eucharist actually actually transforms into the body and blood of right. Christ. The Lutherans believe in what's called consubstantiation, right. Right. and right. that that means that the body and blood of Christ are not in the Eucharist but they're around the Eucharist. They're, they're, it's kind of a weird semantical deal. Um, but if you, uh, if you read the early church fathers, you get an understanding that the communion was never, never was believed to be the actual flesh and blood oh, of Christ. Okay. But uh, because Jesus said, I will not drink of the vine again, until I come into my father's kingdom. He didn't say I'll not drink of the blood again. He said the vine. So it, it's also important to understand uh, the certain Jewish, um, the certain Jewish uh, uh, traditions of what that particular manna or bread, that, that, that the unleavened bread that Jesus had and that cup that he had, what did it mean? Why was it there to begin with? It was a special cup. It was a special bread. It represented something. And so, um, yeah, I just, you know, as a historian myself and having to study this, um, there, the transubstantiation is, is fully and clearly an invention of the Catholic Church. And it does not go into the earlier centuries as far as being believed. Interesting. I've never heard of consubstantiation. That's I'm the just reading that's now. A, yeah, that's the term for the Lutheran, the in and around as opposed to the. Huh. I, I, you know, that's interesting. I'll have to look that up because I swear that when I was in the Lutheran church, that they used to tell us that it was the 
was the body and blood, you know, take the, this is body of Christ given yeah. to Yeah, well, it, 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 it may be, but you, you have to realize that, that Martin Luther came out of the Catholic Church. So Martin Luther brought a lot of things out of the Catholic Church, like infant baptism, um, the, the issue of communion, uh, and anti-Semitism. You know, he, he, was, a, he was a horrible anti-Semite. So uh, he was a man, he, you know, he, he discovered salvation by faith. He stood up to the Catholic church and its corruption, but you have to realize that he grew up in a certain belief system. Right. And so um, he drug some of those beliefs over beliefs. I believe that later on the Protestant church said, no, you know, Luther didn't, I think if Luther had lived long enough, he would have discovered that for himself. But, uh, you know, you're talking about someone who's first generation Protestant having to sift through all of that tradition he was taught in, in regards to communion and in regards to all those other things. So that's where I think uh, his, the history of our early church fathers is helpful in regards to some of this, but also, you know, the Bible, what was Jesus saying? Was Jesus actually telling people, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood? Well, if you take it in the context, and maybe, you know, we'll be able to go in deeper this when we get to that actual part, I'll be able to go in much deeper for you guys on that when we get to that part of John. Can't wait. It's all good stuff, man good i know there's more questions out there i can okay i have another question <laughs> there you see so, okay so i know we've talked about this before like we were saying that um you know catholics wouldn't be real christians but wouldn't it be maybe a little bit true that because there's maybe a difference between your belief your faith and in Christ and and maybe you know going through on your own these beatitudes right and then you just happen to be in the Catholic Church and because you were as Luther was kind of used to these traditions that 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 would get kind of mixed it's just like being in a family well, and always at Christmas a certain way you know and then you just kind of always do it that way even if you yeah, but see, when Luther came to a saving knowledge of Christ, he regarded the Catholic Church as the Antichrist. So I don't think that if you're a true believer and the Holy Spirit is in you, um, you're going to see Catholic doctrine for what it is. Worshiping the saints, worshiping Mary is satanic. There's no nice way to put it. It's satanic. So if you are a true believer, you will end up leaving the Catholic Church because uh, the spirit, you know, you're not going to eat at the table of angels and demons. You just, you're not. So, um, it, it, and if you believe in your heart what the Catholic Church teaches is the gospel, then you're not saved hmm. because they teach a salvation of works. Uh, you know, it's 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 a mess. They do not teach the gospel. So mm -hmm. I do believe if you, you I do, I think someone can be a Catholic and read their Bible and come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And I've known a lot of them who have. But guess what happens? All of them have left the Catholic Church. None of them want to stay in a false church. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to. At that point. What about the other various Orthodox ch uh, churches like Eastern, Armenian, uh, Syrian Orthodox, all these Orthodox, Russian well, You know, Orthodox. I'll be honest, uh, as far, you know, when you're talking about Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, um, Greek, yeah. I don't know enough about them to be able to say. Um, mm -hmm. I've never really studied. I mean, I'm very versed in Catholic theology. Uh, any theology that 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 says that you have to work for your salvation is a false religion. So, mm -hmm. I and I don't know what Greek Orthodox teaches or Eastern Orthodox. I don't know. 
Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, well, excuse me, Martin. <laughs> um, so he's right, the early church was, you know, that Greek Orthodox first church group, and then the Catholic Church sort of came out of that. But when Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, sorry, I don't know why they keep coming up, but, uh, came out of the, uh, you know, the Church of England, which the Catholic Church, uh, they kind of re, the Church of England and the Orthodox Church of a lot of these uh, groups, like Russian Orthodox Church and all these things that kind of formed and changed over time, different revolutions happened and different they were impacted by the Protestant Reformation. And so uh, it is my understanding all broke from the Catholic Church. You know, they stayed, those which were there, which again, kind of taken over everything. So in many ways, they're a branch of the Protestant Reformation, the Orthodox churches of the various countries. So they, they they're, they're tend toward more our Protestant uh, leaning than the Catholic Church. But as uh, Nicole was saying, some things were kept by Orthodox churches that, uh, but they actually adhere to the Bible. And there are things that they have not, seen, you know, clung to the way the Catholic Church did. Like, I, um, I'm only catching half of what you're saying. It's like you're cutting out every other word. Yeah, and I think you need to lean into your, I think you're on your phone and you might want to lean closer to it. Sorry. Um, That's all right. The thing is that the church was, um, the church changed as time went by. And the Protestant Re Reformation impacted the Orthodox Church, such as the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, you know, they, they kind of veered away from the Catholic Church. They, they are a very different group. You can you cannot uh, you must distinguish Orthodox churches. Uh, European Orthodox will distinguish themselves very strongly from the Catholic Church, but there is a crossover. Some of the, the traditions are kept, and you might yeah. say, "Well, it's well, that, like, for instance, the praying to the saints is completely yeah. unbiblical. Is completely unbiblical. You don't see anywhere in the Bible where." Uh, anyone is is told to pray to anyone except for God. Uh, there's the Bible clearly states there's only one mediator, one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. So the issue of praying to saints is not something that the disciples did. So uh, it's um, you know to to lump and say the Orthodox Church was the original church. That's not that's not it's simply not true. You can claim to be the church, and it, it, Protestants can certainly make the claim that their beliefs uh, were the, are the same beliefs as the disciples, so therefore we're the first church, you know, and the church lost its way along through history and had to be brought back through the Protestant Reformation. So it's, it's uh, and the Catholic Church will tell you, no, they were the first church all the way back to, you know, Peter was the first uh, uh, Pope of Rome, right? That's what they believe. So uh, what I'm going to say is that the proof is in the pudding. I don't care if you're Catholic, Protestant, Greek, Orthodox, if you are believing things that are unbiblical, you have lost your way, period. And praying to saints is not something that the Bible uh, ever teaches um, it is something you are praying to dead people. These people were not given any special dispensations to be mediators for us. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that you are to pray only to God. And the Bible makes it clear that there's only one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ. So these are some of the things that, um, you know, the disciples would have never embraced any, a lot of this stuff that's so-called orthodox. A lot of this stuff was brought in through the traditions of men, um, just like the Jews uh, took the law of Moses and added law after law after law, where Jesus says, you're not teaching the you're not teaching God's word. You're teaching the traditions of men. 
So in the same way as Christianity um, worked its way down through history, there was a lot of bad teachings added to it um, that are simply not, they're not biblical. They're not. And praying to saints is not biblical. It's actually satanic. Yeah, there's definitely two schools of thoughts. One of them being sola scriptura, which it sounds like that's definitely where you're coming from, Tony. There's definitely the other school of thought, which is the, the holy tradition and the church tradition as well. So just in my experience, I've, I felt the fullness of my faith as an Orthodox Christian. And but, but the so problem is, is that from. the problem is that nowhere in scripture does it say that anyone can add to scripture or that the traditions of men are just as valid as the Bible. If the traditions of men do not line up with scripture, they are not valid. And see, that's, and that is a big difference between the Orthodox and the Catholic and, and the Protestant. And that is the Orthodox and the Catholic basically believe that they can rival scripture by their councils, that their men can get together and even contradict scripture, which they've done, like the praying of the saints, it's a contradiction to scripture, that just because they get together in a council, they can override God's holy word. And remember what I said? A believer places their faith in the written word of God, not in man, not in the traditions of man, not in councils, but in the scriptures that we know, sola scriptura, are God's word. And anything that is outside of that is outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that that's, I, I hold to that. Um, we've, we've seen the damage that's been done through the years by veering out of scripture and creating men's own tradition. That's exactly why, why Christ condemned the Pharisees. Exactly the same reason. They veered away from the written scripture they were given by the prophets and by Moses, and they, through their councils, uh, created their own traditions. And that's exactly why Jesus condemned them. And that's exactly what the Catholic and Orthodox churches have done. Mm. So, I, I, I mean, history speaks to history and Bible speaks to Bible. You can't get away from that. If Christ condemned the Pharisees for doing that, then I would not want to be doing that either. So speaking Period. of the council, there's been several councils happened in the Christian history, like most famous being the Council of Nicaea. Mm, Three twenty-five. What was that? A, yeah, what was that about? What, yeah, what, the what Catholic was, Medical Council, definitely. The, okay. Yeah, the Catholics will tell you that was the birth of the Catholic Church. It was three twenty-five, right. not not ten fifty-four. So, you know, and we can go round and round and on all of this. But whatever I say, I will defend by God's word, not by the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. If your faith, if your faith is in line with the gospel, if you believe that your salvation is by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, and that the only reason why you are saved is his faith, his, is his death and resurrection and his forgiveness of your sins and your faith for your salvation is totally in Christ, not in works, not in anything else. And that's the gospel. Sola Scriptura, Sola Christos, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, faith alone, Christ alone, scripture alone. Um, that That's it. If you add anything to the word of Christ in order for to get your salvation then it's a false gospel so I'm I, I will always let anyone who wants to talk talk but I will always bring it back to the truth of scripture and what I say I will always back up with scripture all right let me pray and then we'll, we'll get going father lord we thank you for your word and the truth of your word and lord we ask you just um for uh your spirit to lead us into all truth. Uh, help us, Father, to, uh, as, um, as Peter said, where else can we go for the words of life, Lord? And I pray that we would uh, fashion our lives, not according to the traditions of men or to what makes us feel good or to new age type beliefs, but Father, we would fashion our lives according to your word. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good show, Tony. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Amen. Thank uh, you. Pat, Pat, I'll talk Thank to you later. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. You will. Okay. You absolutely will. All right. All right. Good night.